Uh, welcome back to uh, the ECB's Monetary Policy Conference uh, for one of the highlights of the conference. There were many highlights, but this is definitely one of them. Uh, we have the policy panel, and we're very happy to uh, have three eminent uh, monetary policy, European monetary policy makers uh, with us. First of all, Anna Bremann, who's first deputy governor of the Swedish Riksbank. Then we will have Ben Broadband, hopefully, uh, online. Uh, from uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and, of course, our own uh, Philip Lane, uh, member of the Executive Board and uh, Chief Economist of the European Central Bank. So uh, we kind of agreed that uh, each of you will uh, have a short, uh, brief introductory remarks to sort of set the stage, uh, and then we'll go into uh, a Q&A uh, session, hopefully also with, uh, with the audience uh, at the end. So, uh, Anna, can I ask you to, to start? Of course. And thank you for inviting me. It's very good to be here. Um, I feel that I represent the small open economy central bank in this setting. So I'd like to start by just giving you a brief overview of inflationary dynamics, our monetary policy stance, and also the transmission of what we know so far. Um, so if you look at the inflationary dynamics, in Sweden, they've been remarkably similar to sort of an average Euro area country. So inflation peaked just over 10% in December last year. Um, and now we're down at around 4.7% using CPIF. A CPIF is our preferred measure of inflation. It's basically CPI, but with fixed interest rates. So we take out our, the effects of our own interest rate hikes. HICP for Sweden was at 4.5%, so that's for August. We don't have the September number yet. So the, in terms of dynamics, uh, I even looked at the energy price developments, and energy prices peaked to about 43% in December last year in terms of annual terms, and it was like 44 for the euro area. So the whole developments from energy prices, goods prices, high food prices, and now stubbornnessly stubbornnessly high services prices. It's very similar to developments that we've seen in the euro area. And of course then, given that the inflationary dynamics and the shock has been very similar, monetary policy stance is also similar uh, compared to Europe. Uh, so we're at the policy rate first is at 4%. So we did a 25% basis point hike uh, at our last meeting in September. In terms of QT, we don't do any reinvestments as of the end of last year on our monetary policy portfolio. We have government bonds, covered bonds, corporate bonds, and municipality bonds. So we do just let it run off. We have a relatively short duration, but government bonds have a longer average maturity. So we're actively selling government bonds. We took that decision in February. 3.5 billion SECA government bonds is sold every month. And at the June meeting, we increase that to 5 billion. So if we keep this pace, the runoff of the private assets and the government bonds will follow the sort of a similar path. And we peaked at about 900 billion in our monetary policy portfolio and will be down at 100 billion by 2026. So it's a relatively fast QT. And then finally, communication. Uh, so in terms of communication, um, we have stressed data dependence like many other central banks, but we do have a policy rate path. We've had that for many years. And in this environment, having a policy rate path has been somewhat challenging, but we decided to keep it. Currently, the policy rate path is indicating uh, that there might be another rate hike at the end of this year or beginning of next year. Uh, there's about a 40% probability for another rate hike. And then the discussion right now is whether central banks will do the sort of table mountain Matterhorn shape type tightening. Our policy rate path very much resembles the table mountain. So we're saying that we'll keep the policy rate path at this level, policy rate at this level or higher uh, for another, for a considerable period of time. Um, so that's the overall monetary policy stance. If you look at the transmission of monetary policy, our overall assessment is that it's been normal during this hiking cycle compared to previous hiking cycles, but there are a few notable exceptions. And 
if there's one thing that people tend to know about Sweden is that households are relatively highly indebted. So there was some expectations that monetary policy tightening and this front loading that we did might go through the economy rather fast through financial conditions to demand and then to um, inflation. What we've seen is more that it's been normal rather than fast, uh, the, the transmission. And there are two factors that I'd like to stress that has been somewhat different compared to what we've seen historically when we've done tightening. And the first one um, is the pass through from policy rates to deposit rates. In terms of lending rates, it's been normal, but banks have been slow in terms of hiking the deposit rates. And this might not matter that much, but it matters in the environment we're coming out of a pandemic where households have a lot of excess savings. Uh, they don't get any new incentives to save more because banks were so slow in hiking deposit rates. And in addition to that, we have this post-pandemic shift of preferences towards services. So we've seen very strong demand in the services sector uh, being boosted by high excess sa savings from the pandemic. Um, it's one reading, and the reason why I stress it, because we don't have wage growth to the same extent that the rest of Europe. Mm. I'll come back to that later. Um, the other thing that we've seen is the pass through through the currency. So the, the krona has depreciated against the dollar, which is just a, understandable given the Fed tightening cycle. Uh, but the krona has depreciated almost 20% against the euro since the beginning of last year. And in the small open economy, of course, this is a concern when inflation is high. Uh, you get an effect on the import prices, etc., particularly goods and, and food prices. But you get all the other effects on the economy uh, through demand. The export sector has been doing extremely well. It's slowing down now, but it's still been a boost from a weak currency. And in addition, you get um, people who want to travel might just stay at home. You get a lot of inflow of foreign tourists. So the whole sort of services dynamics has been boosted by the weak currency. And it can't be explained by any fundamentals. Um, in terms of market expectations, any way you look at it, 20% depreciation is not a normal pass-through in this environment. Uh, final comment on inflation expectations, and that's more of the good news for us. Inflation expectations, if you look at long run, uh, you tend to call the medium term, we tend to use long run inflation expectations. They've been stable throughout this whole uh, episode. Um, we have collective wage bargaining, and collective wage bargaining has used the inflation target, the 2% anchor, as the anchor for the whole wage negotiations. So we have had the wage negotiations coming up with a two-year uh, agreement with wages increasing just over 7% accumulative over two years. Mm. So that gives us a very good situation in terms of bringing inflation back to target in a timely manner. But it's still hard to explain services prices being so high. They're actually even a bit higher than the euro area. So overall, uh, we've seen... <laughs> Normal transmission of monetary policy with a few exceptions, more resilience in the economy than expected given the interest rate sensitivity among households, uh, but overall normal. And I feel very confident that we will get back to our target um, within a timely manner towards the middle of next year. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for giving us the uh, sort of Swedish, Swedish uh, context. So I guess we'll go alphabetically and from smaller to larger. Uh, ben, thanks for joining us. Uh, floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much for asking me today, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Um, we always count ourselves as a small open economy as well, even if we're larger than Sweden. And I'll come back to some of the implications of that in a moment. <clears throat> so we were asked to talk about, in particular, the transmission of policy. I wanted to make a few points in that context. One is an obvious one, which is that no cycle is quite like another. Um, when we estimate these things, we do so over many episodes, um, just because lots of other stuff is always happening. And you hope to be able to control for those things when you estimate the effects of policy, or at least that they average out in some ways. Um, but I don't think we should expect any episode to look exactly like some impulse response from our empirical estimate. 
one obvious example through this episode for Europe, at least, has been these huge gyrations in energy prices. I don't think it's a coincidence that if you look at the high frequency indicators of activity in Europe, um, both in the UK and the Eurozone, and I'm thinking here of something like the PMIs, they fell pretty steeply both in absolute terms and relative to the United States um, during the first six months after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when energy prices rose very, very steeply. They then started to improve over the following six months, so say from September last year uh, through to this spring, um, and then declined again once energy prices started to stabilize and indeed edge up a bit. So you've always got other things happening, and that's one pretty obvious thing that's been happening in the background, and notwithstanding the blunting effect of fiscal policy, which was considerable, I think these movements in, in energy prices had material effects, and one has to, if not strip them out, then at least recognize that. There are now signs, I think reasonably clear signs, that monetary policy tightening is having some effect, not least in the shape of demand. In the UK, the most interest rate sensitive bit of demand is always um, is related to housing, um, spending on consumer durables, housing investment, um, and those things have weakened quite a lot. Um, even in aggregate, uh, we've seen you know, weaker demand growth and um, the beginnings, at least, of some rise in unemployment, which is now up about three quarters of a point uh, from a year ago. Uh, it's not unreasonable to attribute those in part, at least, to tighter monetary policy. All that said, I think it, it does look a bit weaker. And here I'm talking about the effect of policy. Demand has been a little bit stronger than we would have, than we did expect. Some of that is due to the response of, of fiscal policy. It may also be, and I just don't think it's easy to tell yet, that tighter policy is either slightly weaker than in the past or somewhat delayed. Um, one reason for the weakness relative to the average estimates is exactly the same as Anna highlighted. When everyone's doing it at once, the currency doesn't go up in the way it would if if no one else was tightening monetary policy. We haven't had a material fall in sterling, but nor has it appreciated. It may also be that, at least relative to the past in the UK, the fact that mortgage debt is not entirely priced off the spot rate, but instead depends more on two or three interest rates and comes through only when people refinance their mortgage debt. But that too, that channel too is slightly delayed. Their average mortgage rates on the, on the overall stock of mortgage debt have gone up about 100 basis points only, um, while you know, the relevant swap weights have obviously gone up at much, much more than that. So one might expect that yet to come through. It may also be that that helps to explain some of the differences in um, demand across either side of the Atlantic. Um, I suspect that part of the reason the US, um, Europe is weaker than the United States is still the lingering effects of this big terms of trade shock. Um, in particular, the rise in energy and food prices, but other things as well. Um, that is now abating. But it's also notable, I think, that if you look at interest rates that actually prevail, you know, I gave you a number for the United Kingdom on mortgage debt, the average interest rate has gone up about 100 basis points and will presumably rise further over the next couple of years. It's barely risen in the US. I think it's up about 20 basis points during this cycle and remains lower than it was in say 2019, with much, much longer term debt, um, US households only have to refinance if they move, essentially, and they're choosing not to move house. Um, that has implications for you know, the housing market and maybe the supply side in the US, but it also means that a lot of households have been shielded um, from the very sharp rises in interest rates short and long that we've seen 
over the last year and a half. Um, Anna mentioned the overall path of inflation and a policy. And again, you know, there are differences across countries. Our services inflation has been even higher. Um, <clears throat> but overall, everything has a pretty similar shape to elsewhere. Um, I don't think we are so confident that inflation would be back at target in a year. Um, our forecasts still show it, I think, above 4%. Um, equally, I think over time, the normalization of the terms of trade and the gradual effect of and the continuing effect, even if official interest rates weren't to rise any further, and that's an open question, I'll come, we'll come back to it in the discussion, no doubt. Um, on our forecast, it will be enough at least to assure that in two years, we expect inflation to come down uh, to the target. Um, I'll leave it there for the time being, Frank. Thank you very much. So let me then turn to Philip. Oh, oh, OK. Uh, thank you, Frank. And uh, in, in terms of size of economy, uh, of course, the EU area is a little bit bigger. Um, and the exchange rate channel, uh, it's, it's still you know, visible to us, but, but obviously uh, plays less of a role. So let me uh, start with, with the inflation situation. So October last year, inflation got to around 10% in the EU area. Uh, in September, it was low fours. In our forecast, we have low threes in, in the last quarter of this year, uh, which is basically kind of stitched in for base effects. Remember, the, the peak of the energy surge was around August last year. So basically, every month now, compared to that really high level, uh, there is a, a role for base effects. So we have low threes basically uh, in the background. Uh, the forecast says we'll be back at, at two in mid-25. Uh, and it's important to recognize that the relatively uh, sideways move of inflation next year uh, is basically the, the result of the lifting of fiscal subsidies. So uh, as both of you mentioned, I mean, fiscal played a really big role, especially at the end of uh, 22, started this year. Uh, countries have basically schedules of when, when these subsidies will be lifted, uh, and we will see this at the end of this year, early next year. So the headline inflation rate uh, will look like it's not making a, a ton of progress, if this conjecture is correct, next year. But, but the, if you like, the underlying uh, forces uh, should lead inflation back, back to uh, target in, in mid-25. So let me say, I mean, do, do I think, I mean, if you're super naive, you would uh, draw a graph and say, well, the delta in inflation is uh, already six percentage points. The delta in interest rates, you know, we've, we've raised by 450. And look at this amazing contribution of monetary policy. That is obviously not the way to think about it. Um, but what is true, and uh, the, the ECB staff have published assessments of this, is if interest rates had not been moved, clearly we would have had a very adverse dynamic. Having inflation far away from 2% and very low interest rates would have been a, a very uh, destabilizing dynamic. So, so if you like, the, the first contribution of monetary policy was not to make life worse, not to add pro-cyclicality to the inflation dynamic by, by having uh, real interest rates that, that were too negative. So, so I, I think, uh, as you also mentioned, I mean, the fact that uh, in inflation expectations over the medium or longer term are being anchored, uh, this, this is fundamental to, to, to the assessment that inflation will come back. Let me mention also, uh, again, in terms of the impulse response of this really big shock last year, where we know uh, the labor market moves slowly. So, so we, we had a big drop in, in uh, real wages. Uh, and so a fundamental part of our assessment has been we're in a multi-year phase of nominal wages growing uh, above their long-term uh, steady state uh, rate of increase. So in our projections, we have like mid fives this, mid fives this year, mid fours in, in 24, mid threes in 25. And that is essentially explaining 
why despite energy inflation now being negative, it still takes time for inflation to come back. Ben mentioned that every episode is different and it's difficult to, to overstate that point in this case because we have basically have two big uh, reversals going on. One is the reversal of the surge in energy and we do have to remember, we, we all think we know a lot about oil dynamics, but the, the, the gas dynamic last year was just so uh, unusual. Um, and it has been, I think, uh, a lot has happened uh, to, 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 first of all, reduce vulnerability to gas prices, and second, through this really big uh, response in terms of LNG adaptation, uh, the, the response helps to explain why the economy is not growing very much at the moment, but, but, but I think it's been very important. And then a reversal, which we have to remember is reversing away from the pandemic. That has different phases. Uh, part of it is, as Anna said, I mean, when, when the reopening happened, there, wa there was a, a kind of phase of strong demand for services. Uh, you know, I'm interested in what you said about Sweden. Uh, and one of the questions for us now is after the summer, which was another good summer, in part because of the, the fact that the uh, uh, euro looked uh, attractive against the dollar for American tourists, of course. Uh, the, the, what we are seeing is this uh, spreading of the kind of uh, uh, monetary tightening from manufacturing also to services. So, so that, that is essentially helps to explain why we do have this uh, uh, downgrade in GDP recently. Okay, let me switch to transmission because um, uh, uh, we, we have, uh, I think, different transmission in the EU area. One big thing, which I don't think applies so much to Sweden or, or to England or the UK, is part of what's happened is we were coming out of a kind of atypically super accommodative monetary policy beforehand. And this is not just about the pandemic, it's the years before the pandemic. And it is also the de-anchoring to the downside of inflation expectations. So, so uh, uh, in the keynote yesterday, Doug Diamond showed these amazing yield curves. <laughs> so you see, well, what, what, is, what was everyone convinced about before the pandemic? They're convinced of a super flat, uh, maybe some progress, but basically nominal rates probably not rising much above zero. And look where they are now. And I think part of the transmission in Europe is partly that. There's a, there is a permanent component here. The, the narrative that we're going to be stuck in a low for long uh, is not there. There is confidence that we're not going to be stuck at 4% either in terms of the policy rate. But the pricing is basically over a number of years, a, a kind of gra super gradual return to maybe about two. And that is such a different pathway for, for, for interest rates. It, it makes sense that if you're trying to think about housing markets, investment projects, that, that's a pretty big uh, impulse. Uh, you know, in terms of the mechanics of transmission, you know, I, I think we, we see on lending rates, it, it, it's mostly in line, it's a bit stronger for firms than maybe the historical episode, but maybe I'll emphasize what Lorenzo, yes, in the discussion emphasized also. In terms of credit dynamic, that really has been uh, quite weak and below what we would have expected, uh, say, last year. And in turn, this helps, uh, this can be reconciled, partly because of that long-term change in the interest rate environment, but partly also through the balance sheet policies. We, 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 you know, banks, and this connects maybe to uh, Viral's presentation yesterday, banks, if you go back late 21, would have had a, a kind of vision of a lot of liquidity being in the system indefinitely. And then with the, with the okay, the Teltro roll, roll off was scheduled, but the broader uh, environment is, is less liquid than they might have expected. And this is what they tell us. They tell us in the bank lending survey, they are tightening credit in part because of the, the if you like, the move in the ECB balance sheet. So, so we, we, I think we see a lot of transmission the fact we've downwardly revised GDP in the near term um, uh, reflects that among the many models of, of transmission we run, the evidence is favoring those with significant uh, transmission. So I'm, I'm mindful we, we need to get the questions and so on. So rather than trying to be comprehensive, let me just stop there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. 
I mean, one common theme, I mean, there's many common themes, but uh, one common theme is, is obviously the assessment of the, the transmission uh, of uh, the tightening, the quite substantial tightening that has uh, taken place. Uh, and so I was wondering whether we can dig a bit deeper into, into that. In particular, uh, one question is, okay, we're seeing some signs, but how much is still in the pipeline? That's obviously will be very important for the inflation outlook. Uh, another question, which I think also Ben already pointed uh, to, there have been many structural changes. Uh, of course, there's all the supply type shocks, but there's also, I mean, changes in financial uh, structure. Um, how have they changed uh, the, the transmission of monetary policy? And then maybe a third element, um, which we haven't uh, discussed so much uh, yet, is, is the role of the labor market, which, I mean, in many ways is kind of the last part of the chain uh, and where we see in our uh, jurisdictions that there's still a lot of resilience. Uh, and so how to interpret this resilience in the labor market in the light of you know, this very significant tightening and also the fact that economic activity uh, has already uh, slowed down. Um, Anna, you want to go first again? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of great questions Yeah, just there. pick and choose. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, I, no, but I thought I could comment a little bit on the timing and how much is left. I think if you look at the tightening cycle, we did our first rate hike in April last year, but the large share of the rate hikes was actually last fall. So we're just sort of a normal transmission lag of 12 to 18 months, we should start seeing more effects now. And I think that's exactly what we're doing. What we don't know if there's gonna be somewhat non-linearities, because I think if you look at how households are behaving in this tightening cycle, we been, first we were sur somewhat surprised by the resilience of households, resilience of the housing market, resilience, it's a common patterns in many countries. Mm. Um, but I also think that when you're coming from a period of low interest rates for a long time, uh, households, and unfortunately our data is not great in Sweden in this respect, but we know that on the aggregate level, households had a lot of savings. They had a lot of you know, wealth in terms of both financial assets in real estate, but also liquid savings in savings accounts. And that buffered up a lot during the first hiking cycle. So households had, you know, they'd taken on debt while interest rates were low, but they had also been saving to a large extent. And now when we're tightening, we thought that the transmission would be rather fast because of high levels of debt. We're seeing that having an effect, but it could be that they have resilience towards a certain level. And now when we're reaching those levels, we might see a larger effect so that there's no linearities when you get over a certain threshold. Um, that's hard to know and it's hard to estimate on historical data because we haven't seen such a fast tightening cycle over the time we really had an inflation target. Um, I expect to see some clearer signs of a slowdown now in the coming months than we've seen so far. Uh, but so far, you know, that has been the wrong side to be on. <laughs> But now I actually think that we might be seeing some clearer signs, both because the global economy is slowing down, but also because that we're reaching with clearly much more in contractionary levels right now. Um, so I, 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 I think that the lags have not been, I think the transmission has been reasonably normal, but I expect to see it stronger, uh, more clear evidence of the transmission really working. We've seen it through the credit channel, but also in terms of the demand from households going forward. Then there's a lot of other things, but I'll just stop there and then we can discuss the other things. Okay. Ben, do you want to come in? Sure, oh, I mean, <clears throat> given what I described, what I explained earlier, that the average rate of interest facing households, and I'm talking here purely about the sort of cash flow effects of policy, um, when I said they gave the number 100 basis points for the mortgage rate, that's on the overall stock. We think that this normally plays some part. This, you know, the constrained households, a rise in interest payments matters. Um, given that's been slightly lower than in past episodes, simply because of the slight lengthening of mortgage debt, 
I don't think what we've seen with households in the UK is terribly surprising. Consumption has not been strong. It was strong, as Anders said, when the pandemic-related deposit savings were being run down. Measured correctly, which I think is just to compare those with nominal incomes, if you're interested in the effect on the saving rate, I think that's the appropriate uh, denominator. Much of that is gone. And as it's dwindled, you know, consumption has been relatively weak. The thing that surprised me, certainly, has actually been pockets of strength elsewhere in the economy, in business investment, um, in some areas in particular, business-to-business -business services. Um, those are traditionally probably less sensitive to the interest rate. Um, like Anna, I wonder for how long they can remain strong. Um, so as I said earlier, I think, I think you know, probably on balance, uh, the economy has been less weak than we're expecting. The, sh the, the shape of it suggests that there are signs of monetary tightening. There's some reason to expect it to have been delayed because of the lengthening of, of debt. Um, but I think it's still an open question as to whether it's simply delay or for some reason a s smaller um, overall effect. And, you know, it does matter for small open economies like ours that the United States has been pretty strong, to be honest, where those questions are more acute, therefore. Um, I think there's more of a puzzle as to why the US has not slowed. It's clearly not slowed in the same way through this year as, as Europe. Um, and given the scale of the tightening in the United States, I think there's a, there's a question there as to why it hasn't. And a bigger one than, than exists for Europe. All right. Thank you. Philip? So I, I, I think uh, in the pandemic, there were very different uh, sectoral dynamics. Now, and Monte Pass, we know, also has different effects in different sectors, as Ben just said. So, so I mean, in terms of uh, looking at the data, we probably are going to have a, you know, a, a wave of different uh, uh, information, which will vary quite a lot across sectors. So in this issue about rolling uh, slowdowns in different sectors. Uh, and there, there are a few contrasts to, 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 to the UK experience. For example, manufacturing obviously is bigger for the EU area than, than for, for, for the UK. And so Ben mentioned uh, business to business. My understanding is now the slowdown in manufacturing in Europe is also means uh, business to business services ha have a significant slowdown. Um, le let me mention a few, going back to the overall transmission question, um, some, some headwinds and, ta and tailwinds. The headwinds is, is you know, every week, every month, there are people on fixed rate loans. They're expiring and they're going to be exposed to the higher rates. With the mic over time, I mean, the pass through to, to uh, deposits is ongoing. So as more people switch from overnight to, to term deposits, the overall cost of funding for banks goes up. So, so again, in turn, uh, their attitude to lending uh, will, will also tighten. Uh, over time, uh, in terms of the overall macro uh, environment, some of the tailwinds that were there, such as uh, the, the still ongoing demand for tourism over the summer, uh, the, the reversal of the uh, energy shock, and the fact in manufacturing, there's such a backlog of orders from the pandemic, which kept manufacturing going in the opening months of this year. A, a lot of those are, are no longer tailwinds, uh, and so, it's the interaction of the cost of finance and the overall macro environment. And we are entering a phase now where, where maybe uh, that, that will be reinforcing each other. On the, other hand, on the other hand, the tailwinds, and this is why we do have recovery starting early next year, is, is uh, as real incomes improve. So with the reverse of the terms of trade shock, with nominal wage increases now being paid, um, and people can, in, in your multi-year deals, if you know you, you're getting this 7% over the next couple of years, and in some European countries, it's 10% over the next couple of years, then, then the consumption uh, dynamic uh, will be reinforced. Uh, and then for real estate, one of the open questions is, I think uh, in some markets, once it finds the bottom, 
because the yield curves, a lot of the adjustment was early 22 in the yield curve. So if you think about the housing market in some countries, it's been falling for a long time, but they don't wait until margin tightening is over to st start reinvesting. It's when they think you're at the bottom of the market. And so maybe uh, to be going back to standard patterns, I mean, I think standard patterns, construction, uh, uh, you know, the worst is after about a year. And then it's, it picks up off the floor. It's not back to normal, but it picks up off the floor. Where services may be getting worse in year two, having been less affected in year one. So, so this handover between different sectors, uh, I think, is, is relevant. D just come back to Frank's point about the labor market. This, for me, is a super open question. Uh, we think labor hoarding has been going on. Um, and there's different, there's different issues here. One is, if I have a lot of people on staff, is my marginal labor demand going to be pretty weak? Am I going to be so interested at the margin to hire more people if the macro environment... Uh, so in turn, the, the environment for, for wage bargaining, is, is it the average or is it the margin? And if marginal labor demand is, is weak, th th that should be helped to disinflation. And then second is, we have this uh, rebound uh, from the start of next year, which is fairly strong. And so I can imagine a firm holding on to workers in anticipation of that rebound. But if that proves not to be the path, th then the kind of uh, transition from being a labor hoarder to being a, 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 you know, a normali normalizer of that situation uh, could, could, could be quite significant. So, so I think uh, we will definitely be data dependent in, in looking at the labor market. But also, I mean, what, the way you phrase it at the end is the labor market is at the end of the transmission chain, it's lagging and so on. So, so we do also have to remember in looking at that, uh, uh, it, its connection to the overall cycle has that uh, lagging dimension. Mm. On this last point, I guess also the, no, the, 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 the structure um, the fact that services have been doing pretty well, which are more labor intensive, probably also helps in, in so the, the services sector will be an important uh, sector to look at. Anna, please. Yeah, no, but I was thinking about, because you asked both about the structural shifts and then about the labor market, and they might be highly related here. I mean, it's all these sort of dynamics in terms of just the business cycle that we've seen a strong demand for services, they're labor intensive. But if we look at what we're seeing in terms of the structural composition um, of the different sectors in the economy and the transmission, we do see a relatively fast transmission in terms of construction coming down. Uh, we do see demand for exports slowing down, but we don't see any, any increases in unemployment in those sectors at all. So we clearly see labor hoarding. And we see a structural trend that seems to be relatively consistent among many countries. And not just labor hoarding, but it's skill, um, uh, lack of skilled labor. Mm. That means that the companies are holding on to um, to to, uh, to labor, but they also uh, seem to be thinking in terms of the structural changes in the economy, knowing that they will have to invest in the long term, and therefore they're seeing this as a temporary shock. Um, I'm thinking about in terms of our exports, the green transition is creating a lot of demand. You're seeing a boom in. Um, in labor uh, up north that used to be relatively weak because you get a lot of new industries booming because of the green transition and large investments in those sectors. So I think there is this combination now of the labor market being the last part almost of the transmission in combination with the structural shifts. And on top of that, you have the demographics and the aging uh, with people leaving the labor market, not leaving the labor market and also firms knowing that they have to hold on to the skilled labor that they actually have because it will be so difficult to find uh, new people. So I think those things are interacting. Uh, the, the key thing will be services. We've seen strong demand in services. We've seen labor uh, people who were outside of the labor force coming in and getting jobs in the services sector, if that starts slowing down clearly, then it might be different just in a few months' time. But otherwise, I think the skills story is quite important. I think Ben, mm. no, ben you want to come in? Thanks, Frank. Yes. <clears throat> just to follow up on that, I mean, the la labor market for us has been it's an intense area of focus. Um, and was 
behaving oddly or at least unusually even in 2021. It was a puzzle to us early that year, for example, that as economies, as the UK reopened and employment started recovering, firms drew their employment from, it seems, from the ranks of the unemployed rather than the vast numbers we were, that were reported, at least, to have been furloughed. Um, we've seen, we saw that year a very significant sort of rightwards or upwards shift in the beverage curve, which also suggested there was some mismatch or that the labour market was functioning less well. That was an obvious feature of the economy in the US as well, and it was certainly one in the UK. Um, some of that has started to unwind. We've seen vacancies numbers coming down and with it the VU ratio. Um, equally, I would agree that we're seeing some labour hoarding and we're hearing that from firms as well. Uh, that one may, might make one a little more wary about what will happen to employment going forward. There may be some point at which firms decide that, as Philip said, that if demand does not recover in a way that would justify having held on to those people, that it could weaken um, quite suddenly. Uh, the only other thing I'd say is just to back up what Philip said about these being traditionally seen, at least, as late cycle indicators. And this is a clear risk in both directions, obviously, for policy. Back in the old days, and by the old days, I mean what, what Mervyn King once called the nice decade before we thought there were such things as supply shocks or and we lived in a world that looked or was at least believed to be like the divine coincidence in which the monetary policy that stabilised inflation was also the one that stabilised demand. Um, all you needed to explain movements in official interest rates in the UK was demand itself. Nothing else mattered. I'm talking about, this, about empirical estimates of some kind of um, response function. As we became more uncertain about supply, policymakers started paying more attention to the labour market on the view that movements in unemployment were a more direct measure of changes in slack and a little bit more reliable, perhaps, even if there was a delay between those in demand and changes in demand themselves, because you weren't exactly sure what was happening to underlying productivity. In the last two years, given this dysfunction in the labour market and the severity, extreme severity in the UK of second round effects, what looks like a lot of real income resistance, which can itself be expressed as a rise in the Nehru, we therefore paid more attention to wage growth and indeed price growth and the MPC has been reacting to these things. But in the old view, those are all pretty late cycle indicators. And so there are you know, scenarios in which this embedded inflation has to be responded to further. There are equally ones in which actually the weakness in the real economy accelerates. Those nominal indicators come down, but policy doesn't ease as early as it might have done in those earlier episodes, because we simply can't be sure what's happening to the supply side and to the natural rate of unemployment and so forth. So the, the, we have been, in a sense, trading off timeliness for information about the economy and responding to as it, what Philip rightly called traditionally seen as, as later cycle indicators, but there are no doubt that there are risks embedded in that. Thanks. Can I, can I make a, a t t two points? W one is that uh, you know Sweden uh, may well be benefiting uh, as an export of, gr of green transition technology. That's also visible in the EU area. I mean, the counterfactual where we didn't have the green transition, I, I think the, the slowdown would be worse. It is clearly both through, through the public investment for that, uh, for the green transition, but also private investment. It is, if you like, an autonomous sort of source of support for the economy. The other thing I, I meant to say, because uh, 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 I suppose I, I think I would take a different view about the impact of the Fed. So, see, so you were both emphasising, well, monetary policy is kind of uh, less effective because you, you don't get the appreciation f from tightening. And of course, that's also true for us. But I think we would think of the dominant. F f fact for two-year head inflation being 
uh, global tightening slows down the world economy, it cools down commodity prices, uh, and also uh, through the uh, uh, long end of the yield curve, also rising term premium. So there is a, uh, so, so we, on net, uh, the reason why we think we'll get back to 2% is not just the tightening we have, but, but the, glo the global tightening as well. Um, whereas in the short term, you might get currency effects, but, but for the medium term, uh, I think we do think it's, it, it kind of uh, plays its role uh, in addition to, to, to uh, what, what we are doing. So, please. Yeah. I, I very much agree on that. I do think that the global tightening is beneficial uh, and it's contributing to the quick slowdown in some of the supply uh, or better balances between supply and demand that we're actually already seeing in the inflationary dynamics. But I think that from our perspective, you know, we knew that you would get the impulse from import prices through the global slowdown and that would reduce the import prices. But getting a 20% depreciation against our largest trading partner um, in this hiking cycle when our tightening has been at par um, and in terms of QT doesn't seem to be as important to markets, maybe a little bit more now going ahead. Um, but it's been... Um, um, in terms of the inflationary shock from, from a weak currency, we can estimate that it, it's, it's always a lot of uncertainty. Mm. And we have a rule of thumb that 10% depreciation will get 0 0.5 percentage points on inflation over time if it's sort of a persistence. So maybe just one percentage point from 20% depreciation. That's reasonable to handle given the, the tightening. But we don't know if the effect of a weaker currency might be stronger past you in this environment because firms use it as an excuse. Uh, it becomes a focal point in terms of uh, hiking prices. We've seen it particularly in food prices um, and also in goods prices. A bit difficult to explain that they haven't come down faster given what we see in terms of the global developments and commodity prices. So I just wanted to stress that I agree with you that it's good with the tightening, but a small open economy, um, this tightening has been more challenging because of the depreciation. I mean, if I can kind of broaden uh, the, um, the issue of the exchange rate, which is, I think, I guess, one financial price that we can use to assess also the stance of policy, particularly in uh, small open economies. Um, more generally, uh, how do you assess whether uh, the current uh, policy stance is restrictive enough in the light of, of course, some of the structural changes that we talked about? but also in the light of discussions about where our star may be or may not be, uh, whether we will see uh, sort of an increase in, in our star or have seen already an increase in our star, uh, partly because of the need for, for higher investments, uh, but also the fact, uh, which I think you mentioned, Anna, that we not only have the interest rate, but there's also QT, going in the background. So that has, uh, I guess, an impact on uh, our stance. And then in the current context, we are sort of moving from the focus on the level of the interest rate to sort of the duration. I think all of three of you mentioned uh, that. Again, that also raises questions about how, how to actually man measure uh, the stance of policy. Um, so I was on, and, and then another fact, but you've already mentioned that is also the fact that we're, this is in the context of a global, a global tightening. So you, you, that has, have also an impact. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first. I don't. I, I can start, <laughs> I can, but I can keep it relatively short. So we have a lot of internal estimates. We have a wide, it's a relatively wide range, our estimates of our star, and we're now sort of at the upper limit, just above our internal estimates. We haven't been very vocal. I think, it's, I think it's correct to be cautious uh, right now in terms of having a strong stance of what we believe, given that there are a lot of changes happening. The shock was unusual, and on top of that, you have structural changes in the economy going on. Uh, but I think that in terms of what we do and have a policy rate pass that's been had this shape, you know, front loading, and then we stay at a certain level for quite some time, um, that is important given that uncertainty. So part of that is risk management. Mm. Um, 
it's important for us, given that we don't quite know if our star might be rising over time, to say that we aim to be restrictive for quite some time. Um, and I could go in much more detail, and I can come in later on that, but household, if household and already several, uh, both Ben and, and Philip has mentioned this, but household and firm's expectations are very important in this environment. So it could be, uh, let me keep that one for just a while, but I think that it's currently it's really important to to ensure that households and firm understand um, that we're not just very quickly getting back to what they were used to for a long period of time. Because that, that in terms of the effects of being wrong, it's much worse saying that we will hike and then do quick rate cuts and then end up being wrong about that and having to stay for a high level for a long time compared to saying that we plan on staying at the high level for a long time, things end up being better than expected. Well, then that's not as problematic. But I think that the uncertainty on our star and that it might be trending up is one of several justifications uh, for saying that we need to be in restricted territory for quite some time. Uh, ben, you want to come in? Oh, thanks. Very, um, I'm, I'm a skeptic about our ability to say what our star is in real time, as it were. Um, I saw yesterday a presentation about it um, that had two different methods, which over the long past gave roughly similar messages about how our star had moved, but over the last two years, one had gone up and one had gone down. And around each, there was quite a wide range of um, uncertainty anyway. I think what tends to happen with these estimates, unsurprisingly, is you set policy in response to observable things, all the stuff we've been talking about. You then look back after the event and say, well, look, such and such a thing happened to Pastor. Um, so I rather doubt it can be a useful independent guide to policy given all these observable things to which you respond and what one wants to do, roughly speaking, is have a, a sort of policy reaction rule that is robust to that uncertainty. So I've always been a fan of the quote that John Williams has used often from his namesake, an economist back in the 30s, also called John Williams, who said that the neutral rate of interest was like faith seen by its works, and those works appear after the event, not in time. Um, of course, embedded in any economic forecast, uh, whether or not you use um, some optimal path for policy, there is a view about what that is. And if you look at our, our own forecasts, where inflation comes down, but you know, only gets to target in a couple of years or so, then implicitly what we're saying is the neutral, neutral rate of interest over this period is clearly higher than it was before the pandemic. Um, but that is, a, that is a reflection of all the other things we're assuming in the forecast. There is no sort of independent source of in, information about it. The, the estimates that were done, the longer run estimates before, the explanations that economists had for low R star, um, demographic effects of longer lifetimes, maybe rising inequality, various things, those are relatively slow moving things. But over the kind of periods that we think about for setting policy, two, three years, my own view is that those are rarely useful, as I say, given what the observables are. Um, and in practice, when we said earlier this year we thought policy was restrictive, it was not because we had some independent and precise estimate of our star and we'd suddenly moved above it. It was because we thought things happening in the economy, again, all of those things we've been talking about, that indicated that policy was restricted, that we had probably moved above whatever the prevailing level of short-term R star was. Um, so they're very useful, it's a very useful construct, but I'm not so sure it's of what value it can be, these independent estimates, when you're setting policy in real time. Thanks. So let me, uh, I mean, yesterday morning, uh, Moritz was saying, well, I'm going to look at accommodative policy as you know, real rate below the or star. And I think uh, we would think well, we, where we were before the pandemic was definitely accommodative. So, so what I would say is when you think about the 450 basis points of tightening, 
most of that is moving from being accommodative to being restrictive. It's not reflecting changes in, in kind of the uh, steady state or star. So, so until now, it's not, I haven't spent a lot of time worrying about where is steady state or star. Is it drifting up? Is it drifting down? Because uh, I think there's arguments on both sides uh, of where or star might be. It would become more interesting uh, in a while when we eventually get to, to the uh, normalization phase when we need to bring rates back down from, from where they are towards the steady state. Then, then the kind of vision about where we're going to be, even then, to the extent we go step by step, there's a lot of feedback loops and so on, even then, uh, you know, the, the, all the uncertainties that have been uh, raised are relevant. So this is why, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Ben referred to it, is then moving to a different concept, which is uh, you have some steady state, but then uh, depending on the shocks you face, the interest rate you need not to be adding or subtracting inflation pressure does move around. So, you know, when we had all of these uh, big uh, shutdowns of the economy, the interest rate, uh, uh, and then they reopened, the interest rate you would have needed to have no inflationary pressure would have been uh, quite high. And then as the bottlenecks uh, uh, reverse, th th then, then th that eases to some extent. Uh, so, so I think it can be helpful to think about that. Um, but in the end, uh, restriction is basically in, in what you see. So I think minimal conditions is, are you seeing inflation falling, especially the underlying measures? Uh, yes, we are. Are you seeing, uh, does it cross check with credit? Because if, if you had basically, you know, uh, interest rates that the world believed were below uh, where they should be, you should see very positive credit dynamics. We don't have that. So, so the whole assessment is, it looks like we are restrictive. What I said uh, earlier on was, we think would be low threes inflation at the end of this year. Uh, so we need to squeeze out about one percentage of inflation to go from low threes to two. Uh, then you have to ask, okay, how long do you hold at 4% uh, in order to do that work? Um, and, and I do think 4% uh, is a restrictive level. Then it goes to the issue about there are different strategies. You can basically, uh, as you said, the table mountain approach, uh, you can take di different approaches to, to uh, how you deliver 2%. Uh, but what I would emphasize, which I think is in the spirit of what you said, is robustness. And uh, the robustness of being around four, because what we've seen uh, over the summer is this surge in oil prices. Uh, and yesterday, I think, uh, uh, it, it was in actually Jesper's paper as well, I think, or Matthias' presentation, it's the interaction of the cost push, push shock and the monetary policy stance plays a role. So we did have an accommodative uh, monetary policy. So when you had these cost push shocks, there's not much in the prevailing policy to lean against it. At, at 4%, at a more restrictive level of demand, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, worth th thinking about how, how, what will be the ability of firms to pass through higher energy bills I into prices. It's going to be a lot less at this level of interest rates than it was uh, at the level of interest rates two years ago. So uh, restriction, uh, I think, is, uh, you know, again, ex post is a lot easier to calculate than, than ex ante, which is uh, not, not super helpful, I, I know. But, but I would kind of look at the joint dynamics of credit, output and prices, and then, uh, you know, back it out from that. I mean, I saw we had actually two questions which are related uh, to real interest rates and, and, and our star from, uh, from the WebEx, one by Julian Callow. Perhaps we can discuss the sharp rise in the term premium over the past month, and also whether there is a greater role for analysis and focus on real interest rates, on real interest rates in, in modeling. And from Ben Nelson, do you infer anything from the resilience of many of these economies about so-called neutral interest rates in the longer run, I guess. This is related yeah, to the fact that, to the extent that there is this auto autonomous spending, uh, maybe that leads to an, in an increase in the real rate, and at the same time makes the economy more resilient. 
Um, anyway, I don't, I don't know if any of you want to, to add something related to this question, well, Philip. So, so maybe it's worth mentioning, because I mean, I think, you know, all the models run through real rates. So we absolutely think about real rates. Uh, and so the issue is, uh, if, if it turns out uh, we all hold at more or less current nominal rates for an extended period of time, since inflation is projected to be falling, we have rising real rates next year. On the other hand, we also have this projection, we'll have uh, rising activity levels. There's going to be recovery from the current stagnation. So in other words, people say, well, uh, why are you going to keep nominal rates so high when, when you know, inflation's coming? But, the, but the, basically, the, the, the kind of act, activity levels in the economy are also scheduled to be going up. So, so, this, so the uh, disinflation, if you like, uh, under the assessment we have, does require, uh, it's consistent with rising real rates next year because we do have the recovery. And all of this, I think, is coming from the very basic fact. In the end, what we have is recovering from ne very negative supply shocks. We're below the, maybe unlike the US, we're below the kind of pre-pandemic trend. There's, there's a lot of uh, recovery uh, uh, needs to happen. There's a lot of natural momentum uh, once real income start to grow. Uh, and that naturally can be matched with rising real rates. But having the combination of kind of uh, relatively stable nominal rates uh, uh, and falling uh, expected inflation, you know, that, that's how the model adds up right now. Um, it, it is to have that. So absolutely, uh, to, to Julian, I mean, uh, everything we do is filled to true real rates. Uh, but what I would say is you need to look at those real rates in the full macro model. You can't say uh, definitely ex post real rates are some kind of sufficient statistic to, that tells you everything. Uh, you know, you need to do the full macro ana analysis. Anna, or? Now, I'd like to just... Um related to what we've seen regarding inflation expectations during the shock. So if you look at real rates, do you look at current inflation? Do you look at inflation expectations over the medium term or shorter term? Um, what goes into your models? I highlighted that we are pleased that our inflation, medium term inflation expectations have been very stable. And that is actually market-based and other participants in the economy's survey-based long-term inflation expectations but there's been an enormous variance in inflation expectations across different actors. If you look at households, firms, or uh, market participants, and it's also been over different time horizons. So it becomes very complicated if you consider the different measures that you can use in this respect. And I'm really pleased to see that there's a lot of new research coming out on inflation expectations and how they matter for the transmission of monetary policy, because it's still an area where we know reasonably little um, still. Uh, I still know, I don't think anyone in policy making would disregard inflation expectations in any way. Um, but I do think that, for example, you know, we've seen this nice downward trend in inflation expectations, market participants and firms, but recently we've seen an uptake. Even though inflation is coming down, even though electricity prices come down, even though food prices have been stable now for months, we see household expectations, short-term household expectations are actually starting to go up again. I am not comfortable with that. We know that households tend to form, we know a lot about how households form their inflation expectations. We know that they tend to not be that important, at least not when inflation is low and stable, if you look at the modeling, lots of different research. But in this environment, um, can we feel comfortable with short-term inflation expectations rising? What does that mean uh, for transmission? So I think the question on real rates is important, but I think there will be lots of interesting research to be done in this field going forward that help us because we get so much more variance out of this episode. Mm. Okay. Ben, do you want to...? Um, no, I think we okay. covered it well. I mean, I, obviously we use real rates in the core of our models. Um, changes in nominal rates matter separately, which is a separate effect, but, but the core model has real rates in it. But as Philip said, there, you know, this comes back to the question of our style. There is no single level which is permanently either you know, above which you're restrictive and below which you're not. We had deeply negative real rates 
across the world for many years after the crisis and inflation in many jurisdictions was below target. Um, which is simply a restatement of the fact that oil stock was low. Um, and you know, whether or not this has implications for the long run, I just don't think is knowable. And that was Ben's question. It is in the nature of long run things that it's difficult to estimate changes in them over relatively short periods of time. And unfortunately, even a year of this counts as a relatively short period of time. You know, is the effect of tightening delayed or is it lower because our stars gone up? I mean, I, I just don't think it's, it's possible to answer that question with any precision. Okay, I think it's high time to open up the floor also to the audience here. Let's see if there's any questions. I don't think I have any other questions from, uh, from Webex. Yes, please. Uh, maybe David first, and then. Front row. Thank you, David Lopez Salido from the Federal Reserve Board. So I have a question that is might be too big, but I would like to see what you think about. So, so uh, given the parameters of the conversation that emphasize uncertainty, data dependence, and thinking about policy and uh, uncertainty about the underlying factors of the economy in the medium to longer run. Um, what's your perspective about what's the, the implication for the framework of monetary policy? Are you, you involved in thinking about the extent to which that might change the way central banks should think about policy going forward, given what's been done in the past few years in thinking about that? And uh, the second question is, um, in informing uh, and in communicating policy, uh, what's your view on, in this kind of context, the trade-off between remaining, uh, you know, looking at the data to understand what the true state of the economy is in making your policy decisions or uh, emphasizing your uh, views on your forecast about how the economy is going to evolve, that I was uh, thinking about, and the trade-off between being more discretionary as opposed to making some kind of forecast and lose commitment in thinking about policy. And what's your view on that? Thanks a lot. I think there was a, another. Let's let's take the two questions and. Um, Anna Karistinimi from the European Central Bank. I wanted to touch upon the uh, Swedish experience with the uh, difficult situation with um, uh, depreciating exchange rate. Um, I see that the Europe, Euro area and the Swedish interest rates have been similar levels. So I guess this is driven by US uh, that has tightened a lot more. Also, I wonder what, is, what are the drivers of this? And uh, do you think that we should take better into account the international spillovers in our analysis or assessments? And how do you think that uh, we should do that? Thank you. Thank you. Shall we get some more questions or do you want to first uh, have a go? Let's, let's just collect some more. Uh, have Katrin Asemaker over there? Yeah, I'm Katrin Asema from ECB, and I would have a question to Anna Brennmann. And you mentioned the Matterhorn Table Mountain uh, comparison for interest rates. And I was wondering, what are your pros and cons for these different rate paths, and how do you think about them, especially in light of the current uncertainty, the data uncertainty? Would it be better to first go up and then down quickly, or uh, do you think the Table Mountain is the more attractive path? Jesper? Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so we haven't, you had, none of you really touched on, say, role of fiscal policies. I just wanted to hear your views if you think that, you know, the role of fiscal policy can help you to uh, get inflation back to target if, say, to expansionary fiscal stance it could be a problem for you or not. And then let's take the last one. Thank you. I'm Philippine Cortiman from the uh, European Central Bank. And to Frank's questions on how restrictive monetary policy is, we heard lots of insights on um, the real interest rate, the natural level, and so on. Um, 
not so much on the um, excess liquidity impact. And, and Abraman mentioned it earlier on in telling that the monetary policy tightening with interest rates had um, less effect because it was buffered by the high savings in the first place. And now, where do we stand on that? Okay, I think that's uh, plenty. So, who wants to start? <laughs> well, I can, since there were a couple of questions directed at me, I can try to answer them uh, directly. In terms of the FX, um, of course, the dollar strength is one part of it, but it can't explain the weakness of the krona against the euro uh, in this environment. And I can tell you that in Swedish media right now and among analysts, the, the key thing is to come up for lots of various explanations for this, including going back to... Uh, you know, communication from the Riks banks almost 10 years back. Um, um, I would say that there are probably a number of factors that could have contributed on the margin. One is just that small open economies and our currencies are less liquid. Um, so it tends to get hit when there's a lot of uncertainty. They tend to be correlated with the stock market. Uh, you can see similar developments in the Norwegian krona. Uh, other aspects have been put forward this concern about you know, highly indebted households and the large commercial real estate uh, sector. Um, it's hard to claim, given what we know about the housing market and that the banks don't tend to make any large losses on the commercial real estate they had historically. But even there, the commercial real estate sector is rather diverse with some corporates heavily indebted and some others that have very strong finances. And, the ones that are weaker seem to be dealing with their issues right now. Uh, then, of course, you have the NATO accession and the fact that that hasn't been moving forward as smoothly as possible. There's been some movement in the currency during those days, but again, it can't explain the trend. Uh, in addition to that, you have the fact that the krona seemed to be used as... Um, um, I went up very early this morning, so I'm trying to find the right uh, word, uh, in, in carry trade. So, you know, it's a good funding currency in this environment, uh, especially with the dollar, because it's correlated with the stock market. And on top of that, we've seen some positions from CTAs, uh, some hedge funds that do sort of a trend uh, movements. So this, it's not likely to be one explanation. There's probably likely to be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's all been moving in the wrong direction right now. Um, if you look at fundamentals, very strong public finances, long-term growth prospects are good. Um, I'm quite certain that we'll see a reversal of this trend. Um, but in this environment, uh, it's small open economies, so you, as I said, there are similar trends, Norwegian krona, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, New Zealand as well. So I think it's more, uh, being a small open economy in this kind of environment tends to be um, mm. um, a little bit challenging. Uh, I, I'll stop there and then I'll let the others answer and I can ask you more questions. Ben? Sure, I, th I thought I'd say something about these um, strategies, um, table and hunting. And that's now the accepted metaphor. Um, I mean, as Philip said a moment ago, these are equivalent in terms of what they deliver to inflation. So one shouldn't overemphasize the differences. We're targeting inflation and um, considerations about choosing between them are secondary to that. Uh, so there's no sort of preeminent strategy in that sense. That said, we've been, at least in the policy committee in the UK, talking about this question for a long time. Um, it's long been the case that, that uh, everywhere policy rates are smoother than the simplest of all rules would suggest. And, you know, academics have occasionally attempted to um, explain why that's the case. And it was pretty clear, I think, um, in every jurisdiction, uh, at least to my mind, that in the, for much of last year, certainly, until we reached the stage where banks were central banks were beginning to say they were, quote, data dependent. Um, monetary policy was responding to shocks that we'd already seen over time. You know, if you'd asked me at the beginning of 2022, 
where we were going, it was, I would have said, well, we're going to end up higher than I'm voting for at this meeting. Hmm. And indeed, at every meeting, we said, yes, we've just hiked interest rates, but unless something pretty weird happens, you can expect another hike at the next. And introspectively, I think I certainly asked myself, now, why are we doing this globally? Why are we responding only over time to um, shocks that we've already seen happening? I don't think we're so much in that position once we got to a level that we deemed to be, you know, we were beginning to see effects of it. And then we, everyone introduced the sort of data dependent sense that that phase didn't last forever. No, there are several possible explanations. Um, one I've always liked is similar, at least, to an argument that Woodford used that smoother interest rates give you better purchase over two, three year interest rates. Um, it may also be central banks are reluctant to have very, very big rises for financial stability reasons. Um, if you buy any of those reasons, then you would only at the margin, as I say, because that's not, you know, the primary, primary absolutely sole focus is to get inflation back to target in a sustainable manner. And these considerations are secondary to that. Then you might prefer some sort of table mountain approach. On the other hand, you might object to that and say, well, how is that credible? Is that really a time consistent strategy? And were you to see weakening, you know, would you be forced to sort of ease prematurely? And these are the debates we have about it. Um, I wouldn't want to exaggerate the difference between these two strategies. But as I say, it has always been the case and will presumably always remain the case that you know, central banks prefer not to have very, very violent and huge increases in interest rates. And if you think the shocks you're dealing with are both big and high frequency, that's bound to mean a degree of interest rate smoothing relative to those shocks. That's, that's all I'll say for it. So let me come to, to, to David's uh, original question. Because uh, now the Fed already, and we had just concluded a, a monetary policy strategy review immediately before actually inflation really uh, uh, be, became very, very high. That's been uh, really useful. Uh, all the time I go back and think about this. So first of all, for the ECB to have declared we have a symmetric 2% inflation target, I think it's been really helpful. Because on top of all the uncertainties in the world, if there's uncertainty about what we're trying to do, that would have made it worse. So, so that was very helpful. It's very helpful that we had a you know, full-scale uh, discussion about our policy toolbox. And I think there's been complete clarity, which remains, which is when we're away from the lower bound, the active policy stance tool is to raise the policy rate. And that the balance sheet is a background tool that we, we fully take into account. We do think has real effects. But if we wanted to tighten policy, by far the most effective way to do that is to raise the policy rate. No question. And that holds that the policy rate is, is, and that's been, I think, very helpful to have that clarity, um, given the fact we, we have just had this really big runoff of Teltro's, uh, which is scheduled. Uh, we have zero reinvestment to APP and so on now, but it's clear that is in the background and that the stance can clearly be connected. So at a technical level, all, all of that helps, but, but I think you were focusing more on the role of the forecast versus uh, the realized data. So we, in the, in the, uh, Review, we did come up with this because already the world has seen many structural shocks. The recovery from the global financial crisis and so on had already, and a lot of work also the Fed also had base point, you know, you need to hedge your bets. You know, you have to have the forecast, but it's also wise to, to, to kind of uh, condition your, your policy decision also on the realized part of inflation. And I think where we've ended up now, where we, we really mean it, and it really does help to say uh, policy depends on the outlook, which is both the, the, the base case in the forecast, but also the risk assessment around that forecast. It depends on underlying inflation, even though it has all of the issues that, that Ben raised about late stage you know, uh, indicators, and also the uncertainty about the strength of monetary transmission. It uh, does mean you know, any forecast run takes a view about how powerful is monetary policy. We've not had many hiking cycles. 
the interaction of the hiking cycle with everything else going on, uh, you do need that fee feedback loop. So let me come to this issue about uh, Table Mountain, if that's now the official phrase. Uh, so uh, I guess we need to pay a royalty to, to Hugh Pill if, if, uh, mm -hmm. on this. It, it's for me, there's no time consistency question here because each is self-validating. Uh, obviously, if you go super high, inflation will come down more quickly and you cut more quickly and you get a Matterhorn. Uh, if you follow a flatter profile, inflation returns the target more slowly but equally, that means you need to keep rates higher for longer. And then, uh, as Ben said, I mean, it, it doesn't really, you get to 2% either way, then the question is, what are the side effects? So what is the path for output? You know, the, the impact on the real economy? What is the impact on financial stability? And I think by, by uh, and I would say the choice depends very much on, on essentially how unstable is the situation. In particular, how confident are you that inflation expectations are well anchored? Because, I mean, I think it remains a very big research question. You were saying about the research. One of the really big research questions is the interaction between policy and expectations. So if you believe uh, having a kind of sharper policy hike helps to secure expectations, then that might push you towards the Matterhorn. On the other hand, if you see, well, if people are They've heard us, they've seen us, they can see the data falling, therefore policy can take into account all the other side effects. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's relevant for, for, for the debate. And that answer can probably change over time. Let me mention one thing on household expectations, which is because we have m many countries. That gives us a little bit of a kind of laboratory. And what I would say on household expectations, they, they have edged up a little bit, but there's a clear country correlation where inflation has come down a lot, household expectations are coming down. Where infl inflation's not come down so much, then, then they, so I think that matters. Uh, maybe on fiscal, our forecast, uh, Jesper, assumes that there will be tightening next year. It assumes they will let the subsidies roll off. And if they don't do that, it will be a, a, a positive demand shock, if you like, w which will push up the inflation uh, projection. There's still an unsettled debate uh, about the role of fiscal subsidies last year. If it, if it kind of uh, reduced the peak inflation rate, did that play an important role in, in calming down expectations? And I think that's plausible. At Sintra this year, we had a study by your colleagues at the IMF. Uh, so, so I think the overall uh, debate is ongoing. But at the margin, if we don't have the fiscal pass, we assume uh, it, it, it will matter. Okay. Um, unless there is one final question, I think we are close to the end of uh, this session. Uh, so let me thank all three of you for a very informative uh, discussion. Wish you all the best uh, for the future and uh, I'm sure see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Very Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.